Good morning. And welcome all of you to the divine service here at St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church. For those of you watching and listening to our service, uh, hearty greetings to you also. Our church is located at 1200 East Genesee Street in Frankenmuth, Michigan, and I am Pastor Patrick Ernst. Today is January 30th, 2022. We are observing the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, and the theme of our service today is kind of the darker side of the Epiphany season. You know, the season is really focused on light, on Jesus revealing himself and God's glory through his own person. But today we see, how even when people encounter this light, as John says, they love darkness more than the light. We see people rejecting Jesus, even in his own hometown. In the first lesson, we see how Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet, even encountered resistance or would encounter resistance to his word. In the epistle lesson, the second lesson, which will serve as the basis for the sermon, we see how unbelief can even start to rip apart the church. But the solution to all of this, really the theme that we want to focus on, is love. God's love for us that forgives our sins overcomes our unbelief and then love flowing through us to conflicts in our lives and bind together the church. We'll be using a service that begins on page 15 in the front part of the hymnal, page 15, the common service without communion. For those of you with a bulletin, the entire service is printed there for you. We join together in our opening hymn, hymn 221, Blessed Jesus at Your Word, hymn 221. Please stand. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble at all. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The first lesson we read is taken from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Chapter 1. This is the call of Jeremiah to be a prophet in the service of God. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. 
For to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. We join together in the psalm of the day, Psalm 78. We will sing together the refrain and speak together the verses. O my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will utter things from of old, what we have heard and what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. The Lord decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, so the next generation would know them, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Gospel lesson for this fourth Sunday after Epiphany is taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory be to you. He, that is Jesus, rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. The Gospel of our Lord. (laughs) 
We now confess our holy Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We sing hymn 365, Love Divine, All Love Excelling, hymn 365. God's grace, his peace, his kindness and compassion, dear friends, are yours, alone through the very love-driven work of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. Amen. 
We read now the second lesson for today, taken from 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 13. St. Paul writes, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kind of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. We pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word and these are your people. I pray for them. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, we have a long epistle lesson today, but it serves a very good purpose. We usually hear the core of these verses at a very specific occasion. Think to yourself, what occasion is that? An occasion is a wedding, right? How often don't you go to a wedding and you hear, love is patient and kind, love does not envy or boast, and on it goes. But these verses give us context to remind us that Paul did not write these words first to a married couple, although married couples can definitely apply them uh, to themselves, but to a church. You know, on a wedding day, Love is something that we celebrate, something that we're enjoying. You could say that love is is dressed up in a, a beautiful gown and we admire it just like the bride. But love is such a great thing because it's not just something to enjoy. Love is something that can be tough. Love is something that can be gritty. It can be the thing as we'll find out in the case of 1 Corinthians, that keeps the body of Christ from being pulled apart limb from limb when nasty tensions start to arise in the church. So if love on a wedding day is dressed up like the bride, then love here as we encounter it today has put its overalls and work boots on and is ready to clear away some muck and build something worthwhile. Friends, today we learn the lesson that love works. First, love works in that it takes action. Second, love works in that it does what it's supposed to do. It accomplishes what God sends it out to accomplish. So first, we think about love as something that's always connected to action. Notice that the core of those verses that talk so specifically about love, they don't say so much what love is or is not, but what love does or doesn't do. 
And these verses are very nice to think about if love is something out there or, or if I'm receiving this kind of sacrificial love. But how these verses change when they become the standard for our love toward others. God is essentially saying in his word, okay, you think you're a loving person? We'd all like to call ourselves that. Well, then does your love look like this all the time? Because if not, then your love isn't always true love. In a sense, I think it's easier for us to make statements like, I would cross oceans and continents and I would do all kinds of heroic things to show my love toward you because you're probably never going to be asked to do those things. But to be patient and kind, not irritable, not boasting, not insisting on your own way, that's a very different thing. We shouldn't first hear encouragement from these verses. At least I first hear accusation. John writes in 1 John, his first epistle, God is love. And if God is love, then I do not deserve to have his presence with me. I don't deserve to be in heaven. I don't deserve to be a part of his son's body, the church. Because if I'm something that God is not, then how can I be joined to him? When I am so unloving and God is pure love. But 1 John then goes on to explain how God first rolled up his sleeves and made his love take action for us. Listen to these words. He says, God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrificial payment for our sins. Look at Jesus' life. Jesus' love was not boastful or rude. He didn't insist on his own way. In fact, after loving perfectly through his life, he bowed to the way of his Father, to the way of the cross, and he went there as the, the propitiation, the payment for our sins. In Jesus, we also learn something else about love, that it is not first self-serving, it is other-serving. And whether it's in the context of a friendship or a Christian congregation or a marriage, we have our needs met because we are in these trusting, loving relationships where the members each serve one another. For Jesus' sake, God forgives our sins. Yes, love bears all things because God has even carried our tres trespasses against him right, and has taken them away from us. And Jesus carried our death to the cross and buried it with him in the grave so that we wouldn't have to go through it ourselves. And now, having seen and appreciated and received all that God's done for us, now we love God. We say, yes, this is the family and the kingdom I want to be in because this is the only one where, in spite of my unloving attitudes and behavior, I can still enjoy eternal love and someday be free from my unloving sin. But as we seek to love God, realize that God primarily points us to each other. Remember that Jesus summarized the whole law, all that God expects us to do, in just two commands, and both of them involve love, right? Love God by appreciating his word and showing him respect and honor, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if you want to show love to God, then be patient and kind. Bear with the sins of others even against you with forgiveness and grace, just as God has done with you. And I promise you that will be plenty to focus on this week of a way to live out your faith. Love works in that way. But it also works in that it accomplishes what God sends it out to do. And let's just use God's love as an example of this. God's love motivated him to send his son and it motivated Christ to take your place under the law, 
to take your place under God's wrath and to take your place in the grave so that his resurrection could be your resurrection. And what did that love all accomplish? Well, it took away your sins. It overcame death. It made you free. It made you part of a new, loving, eternal family. So I would say that God's love, by all estimation, is very effective in what it sets out to do. And so is our love. Again, Paul is writing these words to a congregation to confront some very specific problems. And there are all kinds of ways we can think of love working for our lives and for other people. But today we're going to see how God's love unifies the church and how it purifies the church. We had talked about this um, a little while ago, a couple weeks ago, that um, the Corinthian congregation was struggling because different gifts in the congregation were separating people. One person had one ability and another person had another ability and they were jockeying for positions of power and esteem in the congregation. And Paul is saying love doesn't see your fellow Christians as rivals. It sees them as brothers and sisters, forgiving brothers and sisters. Love actually appreciates the diversity of gifts in the church for the building up of the body of Christ. You can think about it this way. Think of all these different gifts and abilities that we find among Christians in a congregation. Think of them like spokes in a wheel. You know, you think of an old-style wagon wheel that has all these spokes that are part of it. Each of those gifts is a spoke, right? Equally given by the same spirit for the good of the church. Love now is like the hub of that wheel. Love is the way that all of those gifts work together for the benefit of all. Without love, without that hub, all the gifts are just spokes lying around and you can't move a wagon with a pile of wagon wheel spokes alone. And this is what Paul's saying when he says, if I speak in tongues and have prophetic powers and have all faith and give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, then those gifts are just loose spokes lying around. He says, I gain nothing. Love also purifies the church. And here I want to give you even more context from the book of 1 Corinthians. The Corinthians weren't just struggling with division over gifts. They had even kind of arranged themselves under different leaders and they'd separated off into these um, opposing factions. They were abusing the Lord's Supper. They were tolerating immorality in their midst. There were some who were claiming that there is no resurrection from the dead. I mean, there was a lot of messy stuff going on in this church. And so many people still today will quote that verse I read earlier, God is love, to mean God's okay with whatever I am doing at the moment. But that's not the way we should read those verses. Remember, God is love in that he sent his son so we could live. Love does not excuse problems. Paul says love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices in the truth. It's a false love that sees a mess in the church and just kind of puts a rug over it. Right? True love gets to work and cleans that mess up. False love excuses problems. True love confronts and corrects problems. If you read the whole epistle of 1 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul is making some very pointed statements. It could even be considered kind of harsh against the Corinthians. But he's writing it out of love. When you join a Christian congregation, you are putting yourself under spiritual authority. And that authority primarily has authorization to call out your sin, which can seem like a harsh thing, so that it can be forgiven. In Jesus' name. That's what Paul has as his end goal here. That these people would know and enjoy the love of God in Christ Jesus. Finally, I want to address uh, the last couple verses of our lesson. Where Paul talks about faith and hope and love being these three kind of key virtues, key elements of the Christian faith. But then he ends with this interesting comment. The greatest of these 
is love. So how is love the greatest? Well, first, our Lutheran confessions point out that the love of a Christian has so many opportunities in the course of a day, in the course of a life, to show itself in action, in service toward others. By being kind, by refusing to be resentful or boastful, you aren't decreasing your love, but no, it's as if there's this infinite, perpetual blessing that loving Christians are able to be to the people around them. So in that way, love is the greatest in that it has all of this wonderful fruit that it points back to the gospel and the source of our love. But the second reason why love is the greatest is because it's eternal. Let's think about faith and hope for a moment. What does faith do? <clears throat> faith trusts that God and what he says is true even if we don't see it or don't fully experience it. God says that my sins are forgiven and yet I still keep, keep on sinning. And I may not feel that my sins are forgiven, but I trust that it's the case because God says it in his word. What does hope do? Hope looks forward to good things in the future. When we're finally in heaven, we will need neither faith nor hope. Now in the time of Paul, mirrors were often not made out of glass, they were made out of brass. And so if you had this polished brass that you were looking at yourself and it was still a little bit cloudy, a little bit unclear. That's the way our faith is here in the world. We just kind of see and believe in part. But Paul says in heaven, we will see God face to face. We will fully experience what it's like to be free from sin forever. All of our hopes will have finally come true. But the one thing that will still be there is love. We will be experiencing God's love in an even fuller, richer way than we can ever experience here in the world. So love is the greatest because love never ends, as Paul says. We all want to do things that will last in life. We all want to make a lasting impact and have a legacy. I want you to realize that love will last. That's what Paul has told us. Nations and empires rise and fall, but I want you to listen to what Jesus himself says about simple acts of love. He says, just as an example, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. To go back to the picture I was using earlier, when we're in heaven, love will be dressed up in her beautiful gown and we will admire her as we do a bride on a wedding day. But here on earth, our love imitates the love of Christ when he was in the world. Love that is humble, love that is sacrificial. Here in the world, your love gets up in the morning and puts her overalls and boots on and has to just get to work. But it's worth it. Because as Jesus says, the things that your love accomplishes throughout the day, those things are the longest lasting, the most impactful treasures that you create. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Lord, as we have today seen in Scripture and as we see in the world around us, your Son has faced in so many times and places rejection and persecution. We pray that these would never be found in our hearts or in our homes. Let your Spirit fill our lives so that we can stand up against whatever threatens our faith. When there is conflict among us, let love have the last word. Where there is doubt, let your word be a sturdy support. Keep the lies of the devil from leading any Christians astray because we know all he wants is to deprive us of you and our happiness. Destroy the enemies of your church and the enemies of your grace. Help those who are persecuted and bring back all who are straying, especially from our congregation. In line with what you have said, we send out your word and trust that it will accomplish all these things. Finally, we give you thanks this week for giving George Engelhardt a successful knee surgery. Give him a smooth recovery and good health going forward. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and join together in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We sing hymn number 371. O love how deep. Hymn 371.
We pray. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please remain standing for the closing hymn. We sing hymn 334, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, hymn 334. You may be seated. Again, a good morning and a welcome to all of you. Special welcome, as always, to our guests and visitors. Uh, feel free to speak to me if you have any questions about our church. Sign the guest register in the gathering space, and we hope to see you again soon. I don't have any special announcements today, and so consult your bulletin for the upcoming calendar for the week and for any special announcements. The monthly newsletter and calendar is now out for February, so if you'd like a printed copy of that, please pick it up on your way out. Until we meet again, God's peace.